Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers. Come right on in, my friend. We're going to have a wonderful time today. I hope you can be with us all the way. If you're a brand new viewer, welcome, welcome. We're glad to have you. Uh, you're going to be so interested uh, to hear what my guest has to say, Doug Gaiman, and he is the uh, president of Globe International and author of three books. Uh, we're going to talk about this one. When I saw this title, I thought, boy, is this ever needed right now? We've got a lot of quitters, even in the church, but in, in the generation, all, you know, the people that just kind of drop out of life. This is a wonderful book. I want you to hear all about it. And um, I'm going to join Stephanie. We're going to make a chicken pot pie bubble up casserole. It's kind of an interesting thing. You ever get any of those frozen uh, chicken pot pies from the grocery store? Some of them pretty good. Uh, so we'll taste this one and see. And, and it's kind of big, and so we've got one made, and we're going to make one. So I need to tell the crew we got lunch for you for the rest of the week. There's just no problem. Don't fix your lunch. Uh, before I join Stephanie, though, I stumbled onto this. Uh, remember the book that was so popular for so long, The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And I don't know how many million it sold, but... Um, I found a, condens a little condensation of it, and um, I always loved the way it started out. Remember how that book started out? Because it said, <clears throat> what on earth am I here for? And the first line in the book is, it's not about you. Isn't that genius? And then he talks about the really purpose of your life. And maybe you thought, I'm going to get that book because you've heard so much about it, all these um, been a few years now and you never did this will give you a really good idea of what's in it and it's yours for any gift to this ministry any gift at all um, you can use your credit card 1-800-229-0059 or write to us at box 6922 clearwater florida 33758 and i highly highly recommend this and i'm so thankful that they came out with this real small condensed version of it and um you can find out why you're here. It's well defined in the book. And I'm here yes. with Stephanie. Here we are. And I know why I'm here. Okay, good. We're, we're going to make a chicken pot oh, pie. Oh, okay. I know why I'm here too then. I'm yeah. making chicken pot mm -hmm. pie. Okay. So All right. Go for it. We have two cups of cooked chicken. We have a can of cream of um, chicken soup, a cup of sour cream, a cup of cheddar cheese, some salt, and some garlic salt. You have biscuits that you're cutting up, and yeah. we also have frozen vegetables that I... Um, that we thought to make uh -huh. cooking type just a little bit less. And I think you've never seen a chicken pot pie like this. She's very, very mean yes. to biscuits. Oh, so mean. What a way to get rid of your <laughs> frustration. <laughs> Two cups of chicken. So we, we, this is how easy this is, okay? We're just going to mix everything together. We're gonna, she's going to cut this. even the biscuits. And we're going to pour it in a sprayed 9 by 13 pan. And you bake it at 375 for about 45 minutes. And the truth is they really do bubble up. And it, it really, yes, uh -huh. it really does bubble up. So yesterday, do you know what yesterday, yesterday was? Yesterday was Stephanie's birthday. It was now, my did birthday. Did you really celebrate last night? You know, most most people know that I went through cancer. So I'm thrilled to be turning 52 Just to be here. years old. Yeah. I'm thrilled. Yes. Yes. I, I used to always say I was 29. But you know what? I'm very happy to be 52. So That's it was a truth. great day. Went to um, dinner with the kids and some of the grandkids last night. And it was just really, really I nice. I don't think you look like a grandma, but. Well, thank you. Um, I'll take that. I have said so many times I'm thankful to have lived to see nine great grandchildren. Oh, that's a lot. And this newest one, Olivia, she laughs all the time. She's I love about it. Four months old now. Sweet. I love laughter. And then I've got one who's 15 and he works at Chick fil A. Wow. I hope to be here that long to see many. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's an absolute blessing. Yes. But I only have grandsons right now, so. Dear Lord in heaven, I would love a granddaughter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little prayer there. <laughs> well, also, now my kids and my grandkids have gone on a lot of missions trips. Mm -hmm. But I've got great grandkids going now. Oh, wonderful. And I was telling our guest about it because his life is missions. Yes. And, boy, it changes them. Okay, i got to go get over the sink because yes. she's afraid I'll fall down. Yes. because we If, had, I, if you make the floor <laughs> slick, you might fall down. We've had down. incidents. Well, I'll tell you, at church, because I do the nursery at church, and we ran out of babies. 
So I put an all call out to the very young married couples and I told them that I need babies. Guess what? We have two pregnant girls in our church. Oh Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I've never heard such a story. I did. I put it on Facebook. I'm like, listen, you young married people, you need yes. to get busy because yes. I need some babies in the nursery. Because you're supposed to multiply and replenish yes. the earth. Yes. So I get a note at first commandment. I got a note at church last Sunday. This is a surprise just for you. <laughs> Baby due in August. Well, I would say Thank you, you are listening. extremely influential. <laughs> Extremely. And then you have the older, you know, ladies like, don't look at me. Yeah. <laughs> so we just mixed, we put the biscuits in, we just put everything I in the bowl. I know, I was so I mean, surprised when I saw. I thought, when I first saw it, I thought we would dollop I the biscuits too. on top. I did too. But nope, nope. So do you want to bring it over? Yes, ma'am. And it's beautiful. So this is a sprayed 9 by 13. Mm -hmm. This makes a huge, you could make this and freeze some of it. Well, that's it makes, why I tell the crew. Not we, all week. We're we not lunch all week. Yeah, no. No. But these two? Not if I'm eating. Isn't that no. pretty? <laughs> That's lovely, isn't it? And the name is so right apropos. on. Bubble up. So apropos. Sharon Bailey told me she wants this recipe. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, we'll make sure she... Well, I don't know if I want to give Sharon Bailey the recipe because I still haven't gotten a piece of her homemade apple pie. So do I hold grudges? Yes. No? <laughs> that would be yes. <laughs> no, I love her. She's amazing. It's so good, That's right? That's awfully good. You could add a little more seasonings to it even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good. So it's, easy. And you saw so how easy, easy it is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you have most of those ingredients on hand for anyway. Sure. If you want this recipe, it's yours for free. Information is coming up on your screen. And um, choose the way you'd like to have it, and we'll get it to you. And I want you to meet my guests because I love missionary work. Stay with us. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may receive it by contacting us through social media as listed on the screen. When requesting a copy through the mail, be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. Thank you, and please know we always appreciate hearing from our viewers. All right, my guest, Doug Gaiman, and you're president of Globe International, which is a sending source. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. If people feel a call of God on their life to go into missions, and um, they would contact you, with your experience, could you sit down and maybe, maybe they don't know for sure where? Right. Have you had that happen? Yes, that happens. Probably more common is people have had a short-term missions experience somewhere mm -hmm. and it awakens something in them that they want to expo explore further. Mm -hmm. And so they'll, if they know about us, they'll contact us. Of course, there's a lot of agencies out there, so they'll contact us and say, I've had this experience, I want to go somewhere, I might want to go back to that country and serve because I've become aware of a need there. Or they may say, I've always had a heart for Asia. I went First, to Central America because it's close. You know, it's easy. I, I joke with our Central American people. You can leave after breakfast and get there before lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you with it. your experience, you can probably help them figure that out. Yes. They might come with an idea, and when you sit down with them a while, with your experience and the Holy Spirit and all of it, you know, it might not be the place for them. It might right. be somewhere else. But well, we always encourage them to get some training. There's some good training programs that, that don't interrupt your life too much. It's mm -hmm. not like you have to quit and go back to college. That's always a good thing. But mm -hmm. if you want to, there's some programs you can take that help you uh, kind of become more aware of what's going on around the world and some of the challenges in missions and the opportunities. So we encourage that to sort of broaden people's horizons, and that mm -hmm. often redirects some of their thinking. Yeah, you... Uh, the information that you and your wife have been in 60 nations, that just mm -hmm. <laughs> blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, because you've really seen how most of the world lives. Yep. I mean, you get, you get around, you know, I've started out in Central America when I was a young man before we were married. And then, of course, we spent most of our adult life before we came back and worked at Globe. We lived for 15 years in mm -hmm in Asia, and so we were in mo many of the countries of Southeast Asia, living in Thailand a lot of the time, and a couple of other places during that time. So, yeah. Well, 
You've written a couple other books. What, what are the names of those books? Well, my first book was called Go to the Ripe Fields First, and it was a short mm-hmm. part of my about. doctoral dissertation. I took a piece out of it and basically made a case for why certain parts of the world, certain people groups are hungry for God more mm-hmm. than others. Some are very resistant and some are very open, which in Jesus' vernacular was harvestable. And I wrote a book about why that is. Now, what would be the most harvestable today that, in your opinion? Well, it's kind of a fluid situation. If you think about the, the agriculture metaphor that Jesus uses, when, you know, when the, the wheat gets you know, ripe, ripe mm-hmm. there's a short time that's going to be right, and mm-hmm. then, it, then it goes bad if you don't harvest it. So uh, people are the same way. The metaphor works. There's a time that they become open to the gospel. Usually it's because of trauma. It might be a natural disaster. It might be war. It might be migration or discrimination, a racial thing inside of a country, racial wars. Typically they've suffered something, and then they become open to a new idea. And if Christians are there preaching the gospel, which to me the gospel is one of the coolest new ideas ever. <laughs> you know, God actually loves us. You know, the Creator is a benevolent Creator, and, and He sent His Son. Prayers. He listens. He's attentive. He knows us. He's not. He's not distant. He's well, don't we have a experience of that uh, in our lifetime? Because there was a time when Russia was closed down. Mm-hmm. It was open for one, but it's not that open anymore, is it? Right. There was that period when the wall came down during the the Reagan administration, Mm -hmm. and a lot of a a lot of churches and mission agencies responded and went to the former Soviet Union, and then it kind of changed. So, yeah, that happens. When Reagan said, "Tear down that wall," (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and so we we have that illustration right there. Mm -hmm. A lot of people watching know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It was ironclad. You could not get a Bible in Russia, you know, mm-hmm. for any reason. It was a window of time. My my son went there many times, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of churches did. A lot of preachers oh, yeah. did. Oh yeah. But it's not easy now. It's changed, yeah, for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, this book's forwarded by Luis Palau. How is he? I know that he's been battling cancer. He is a he's a living miracle, uh, mm-hmm. and this is my opinion. But he he gave, was given four months to live more than two years ago, mm-hmm. and he's still going strong, still traveling, still preaching. He's slowed down. I mean, he's in his mid 80s, so he it's be normal. I interviewed him once. Very, very impressive. Oh but yeah. Evangelism is his whole life. Oh my, he is a living, breathing gospel preacher. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that's a. Uh, that's a real blessing for mm-hmm. you. Okay, before you quit, what gave you that title? Because it grabbed me. I, I think we got a lot of quitters in this in this nation. Right. And <clears throat> I've lived long enough to see the tenacity of other generations. Yeah. Well, the first rendering that I, I my idea, and Moody as Moody Publishers has helped me, you know, work on a ra- number of titles. Uh, I had the title. So you say you want to quit? Like a question mark. Mm-hmm. And uh, they like that, but then someone said, you know, that might sound to some people like you're trying to get over an addiction, mm-hmm. if you think about it. So we decided, let's tweak it. And a friend of mine actually said, why not before you quit? It just mm-hmm. out of the blue when we are having coffee, he said, what, what about before you quit? Mm-hmm. So I presented that to Moody, and they loved it immediately. And they did a little study among some of the students at... Um, Moody, you know, at, at Moody, uh, yeah, yeah, well, Moody and Moody School, mm-hmm. and um, all the students, far and away, all the other titles, they like this one, so we mm-hmm. went with this one. Now, is this a, a metaphor for something that was going in, on in your life? Were you, <clears throat> were you thinking about quitting? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've gone through, you can't get to be my age without <laughs> having suffered some disappointments and some losses, and So we, you know, I went through times where Mm -hmm. difficulty in ministry, where it wasn't going the way you wanted, and it took longer to get to that point of success that you were looking for. Our marriage went through some trying times between my wife and I. We were coming up on 44 years, but there was a period in the middle where we didn't like each we didn't like each other very much, but we we decided to to hang in there. Thank God you you didn't quit. And now we're in love again. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you know, I I learned through the difficulties if you just hang in there. The sun comes out again. Mm-hmm. Life gets better, um, and mm-hmm. ministry gets fruitful, even if you're going through a desert for a period. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of things that should give us pause. Should make a look. Uh, we have an awful high rate of suicide. Mm-hmm. That's quitting. Mm-hmm. That is the ultimate quitting. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, a lot of young people. Yeah. Well, Tim, Tim Keller, you know, Pastor of Redeemer Church in New York, he's obviously a prolific writer. One of the things he said that really impacted me, and I quote him in my book about this, he says that Western cultures, um, all cultures of the world, have a way to deal with difficulty. You know, we all, cultures have a way to deal with death. You have mm -hmm. what's called a funeral <clears throat> ceremony, and every culture mm -hmm. defines what you wear and how it looks. We have, we have ways of dealing with things. Mm -hmm. The Western cultures of the world are unique in one aspect, and that is we don't know how to deal with grief. We don't have mechanisms to really help people deal with grief. We're one of the cultures, not just the United States culture, but some of the cultures of the West, European cultures. We're, we're kind of juvenile in our understanding of how to deal with grief, and part of that has grown out of modern technology. We've solved so many problems. You know, we've advanced medical science, technology. We've made life better. Most of the Western cultures of the world are safe. You can live in safety compared to m many other nations of the world. So we've come to sort of be entitled. We think life should go w well for us. Mm -hmm. We should have everything we need. We should be safe. We should have money. And so when we don't, we're we're at a loss to know how to deal with difficulty. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a dysfunction because life has difficulty. Yeah, I was thinking of, of the difference, and I've lived long, long enough, a long time, by the way, um, to, I remember the Second World War. Mm -hmm. I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. And um, those brave soldiers who, yep. they stormed the beaches of Normandy and a lot of them lost their life. They were mm -hmm. teenagers. Oh, a lot yeah. of them were teenagers. Mm -hmm. And you compare that now with kids in our universities. I don't think I would send a child to a lot of these universities. Mm -hmm. um, they don't like who was elected president, so they need stuffed animals and uh, they need safe spaces. Mm -hmm. I heard all that stuff, but kind of wanted to throw up, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. <laughs> Well, part of that is symptomatic of our culture's inability to deal with difficulty, you know, uh -huh. because of a, a strong sense of, and, I, and I'm not just accusing the person, but the culture itself is reinforcing these things for us with this sort of sense of entitlement. We're entitled right. to something better. Yes. And when I don't have it, it's someone else's fault, which actually can be true. It still comes back to me, what am I going to do with this grief? Uh, Typically, our when we when we have to persevere through something, we have to get through a difficulty. It's because you use that word a lot in this book. Yeah, it's persevere. it's it's about perseverance, and the reason we persevere because perseverance isn't fun. You know, it's mm. it's not the happiness is gone, the enjoyment is gone. We're we're feeling a sense of loss and difficulty, and it's usually because we've lost something related to either our time mm -hmm. or our treasure or our enjoyment or a relationship. Something has been taken from us. We feel robbed of it and we're, we're, we're mad. Everything's supposed to go my way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's, that's normal to all human beings. It's just in the Western cultures, we are not really well equipped for when it doesn't. And the reality of life is, is it doesn't it, always go the way. It, One way or another. Yeah, it's going to yeah. hit you, and we have to be equipped with deal. How do we deal with that and not just fall apart? Did you do triathlons? I have. I've done one triathlon. Oh my goodness! I've I, done see, three I, marathons. <laughs> oh, I am so impressed. Uh, I exercise every day, but never ever came close yeah. to that. Well, I talk about the first triat, the only triathlon well, that's a I've ever done. Well, great metaphor for your book. Oh yeah, I mean. The, the swimming part was a part that scared me. I, I've always been able to swim, but there's a difference between swimming in a pool and swimming in water that's over your head and, and far out. And coming against you? Yeah. So I, I realized when I was training that I had a deathly fear of drowning in water that was deep because I'd get out in the middle of a bay, you know, because you're just going to swim in the triathlon I did. I had to swim a third of a mile, which is nothing mm -hmm. to big, big time swimmers. But I realized I had to get over this fear because the panic will make you just quit and swim to shore right. and quit. So I trained in shallow water until I got over the fear and realized I can swim this distance, you know, in shallow water. So what's the difference between five feet of water and 20 feet of water? It's, there's no difference when you can swim it. In the triathlon, though, it, I got halfway through you know, out on the bay and I was, I was drowning. I was out of breath tired because of the adrenaline of all the other people swimming with me. I desperately wanted to swim over to one of the lifeboats because they have them along the way uh -huh. for people get into trouble. 
I wanted to swim over there so bad and just quit and say, forget this, I can't do it. But then I just paused for a moment. I went into a, what they call like a doggy paddle, you know, or a yeah. breaststroke to, to relax. And I said, no, I trained for this. I can do this, Praise I can God. do this. That's a great story. Yeah, so I didn't go over to the boat. It was right there, which uh -huh. gave me a little comfort. And I just rested and breathed and then I started swimming again. And I finished the swim and then I killed the bike ride. They always say kill the bike yeah. ride and then just coast on the run. So I did that and I actually came in fourth in my class. So not too bad. That, that is <laughs> so impressive. Um, I, re I recently I read about a missionary who, and I guess they gave the name, I read it on the internet somewhere, but, and I don't remember the country, but he gave his life there and maybe started a little church, felt he was a complete failure, yeah. complete. Mm -hmm. But these decades later, because he planted that, um, it, this country's flourishing yeah, with right, Christians. Right. And that's not the world's view mm -hmm. of success. Mm -hmm. Well, you, th you think about when you compare it with the world's view, it's very temporal oriented. You mm -hmm. know, we, whereas Christians, we are eternally oriented. We, we are attached to eternal God. Mm -hmm. We have an eternal home. So our values need to, in some way, the way we live now, need to be reflected by that reality that what I do today counts for all of eternity. It's not just making a pile of money that I can spend in the 85 to 87 years that I got now. Uh, whereas if I don't make all that, but I impact people's lives and I'm never known, God knows who I am, you know? That's right. And I might be anonymous and it look in the world standards, I might be a failure, but God knows who yeah. I am. And that's um, an important distinction between Christian values and, and non-Christian values. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to serve the Lord at all in any capacity, you will come against a desire to quit. Mm -hmm. Satan will be, make sure you do it. Oh, yeah. For sure. Um, when, uh, when you first went to Asia, uh, were there a lot of obstacles and, and how do you adjust to the culture? But well, you couldn't quit. Yeah, I had, we had done an internship with a leader and he really lived determination in front of me and it, it had a huge impact on, on our lives and I talk about that in the introduction to the book. It mm -hmm. took him three years to formulate his ministry and really go into a fruitful time and I kind of tucked that away so at three years, you know, so I can, I can be willing to be determined and, you know, pay, pay my dues and work in the dirt, you know, and lay the groundwork and not see any fruit for three years. So when I planted our own ministry, that was my mindset. Well, three years came and went. <laughs> and I think it, I was ahead of you on that. <laughs> at the end of the three years, I'm like, okay, where's the fruit? Yeah. You know, I, I had this, I had my own clock. Right. This is part of our issue with perseverance. We all have our own timetable of when things are supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And when we start suffering loss as a result of the timetable isn't working like we thought, we tend to get discouraged or angry. We start to question God. Maybe our faith has a crisis. And this is what happened to me. And it actually took uh, us about four and a half years to get to the catalytic moment where we started seeing fruit. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had to make a decision at that three year, three and a half year mark. Was I going to quit? Or was I going to go into a learning mode and say, okay, what am I missing? You know, yeah. I'm missing something. Yes. So what, what is God trying to teach me rather than just abandon him? Was this after the triathlon? Oh, yeah, the triathlon was more well, recent years. the triathlon years. taught you that. <laughs> <laughs> if you just tuned in, I'm talking to Doug Gaiman, and uh, the book is Before You Quit. When I saw that title, it grabbed me. I think we've got a lot of quitters in our country, and sorry that we have a few in Christianity, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to get this book because we're barely scratching the surface. You quoted... Um, C.S. Lewis. Yes. Yeah. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Yes. Boy, that's a good line. Yeah. Like, and like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because we cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea, we are far too easily pleased. Mm -hmm. So we'd rather stay down here than... Um, yeah. 
risk. Yeah, well, step. I, I mean, we, we have to live in this world. You know, God's placed us here for a purpose, mm -hmm. and we have these years that we of, of human life on this planet to live before we go into mm -hmm. our eternity. As a Christian, we have hope in eternity. We're not afraid right. of death. We have, we have hope in eternity. And I think one of the challenges of perseverance is to teach us to have eternal values, to say the thing that I'm losing now, whether it's a relationship or some monetary security or my job isn't any fun, to frame that disappointment or that dis difficulty in, in an eternal perspective, Amen. a transcendent perspective that my life is secure in Christ. I, I cannot be moved off of my solid foundation. Mm -hmm. And if, I, if we can find that, you can get through any difficulty. That's, a, that's so biblical. Mm -hmm. I think the, a preacher that had the greatest impact on my life was H.B. Kelchner. It's been heaven a long time, but he would tell pastors, I have a, one message. It takes me either 10 days or two weeks to preach it. <laughs> but it was living your life now yeah. in, the light, in the light of eternity. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was thinking about your book, uh, I was drawn to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, where we've got that great, you know, hall of faith, that yes. Smithsonian of faith. Mm -hmm. But then it said, but there were others. Mm -hmm. yep. And they were sawn asunder. Mm -hmm. And they had nothing. Right, no right. No victory in their life, that's for sure. Yep. When you think about people, that's one of the one of the kinds of perseverance I talk about in my book is called moral courage. Mm -hmm. Those people had moral courage. Yes. They had to persevere even without a knowledge of the outcome. Mm -hmm. They might live to see a better day, they might not. Mm -hmm. And yet they held held the line with their faith. They said it's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, stood before the king and mm -hmm. said, We will not bow down. Our God is able to ser to save us and deliver us out of your hands, O King. But if he doesn't but if not. we're not gonna bow down. So the only way they could say something like that was with a transcendent eternal perspective. Amen. We are out of time. If you come back around, visit me again, will you? I would okay. like to do that. Okay. Don't forget this book before you quit. Some of you, I really believe, when this program started, you were thinking about quitting. I hope you're rethinking that. I hope you go to that website and get this book. Um, God didn't call us to quit. <laughs> he called us to follow him all the way, no matter what was along the pathway. Hey, join me next time remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a Homekeepers program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.